I'm preaching today, if you have your Bibles and you want to look at the text, it's going to be Psalm 37. Psalm 37, my favorite psalm I get to preach on today, and I'm just excited about that. While you're looking up Psalm 37, I want to thank uh, this praise team, man, didn't they do an awesome job? Give them a round. Amen, amen. I consider it one of the uh, greatest privileges of my ministry to be able to be on the uh, stage up here, a platform, pulpit, whatever you call this up here with these talented individuals who, who sing for us every, every week. Thank you, Pastor Brad and Pastor Eric for preaching last week while I was gone and uh, conducting the Bible studies. And if I started uh, getting, getting further deep into the catalog of people I need to thank, we'd probably never get any message preached this morning, but I'm thankful to be here today. Psalm 37, uh, I want to preach today a message that my sincere desire is that you are encouraged by this message. Because Psalm 37 has been a touchstone, it's been a, a guiding light, it's been a, it's been a rock for me to hold on to personally for, for over 40 years. And there's three truths here I want to point out to you, you probably already know them, but we need to be reminded of them. And these three truths will anchor your soul so that you can face the future with confidence. And that's what the message is today, facing the future with confidence. Psalm 37, I'm going to read verses 1 through 6 and then make reference to the entire psalm. Do not fret because of evildoers. Be not envious toward wrongdoers. For they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desire of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in Him and He'll do it. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. Uh, we, we discussed this morning in the deacons meeting the status of the world. Isn't it a mess? Uh, now there's a lot of things that uh, just bother us and make us nervous. Uh, I wrote these words 13 years ago. And normally I never think that anything I wrote, but it's appropriate today because of where we're going with this message. I wrote these three paragraphs in 2010. It's easy to get worried, frightened, and even pessimistic these days. If you watch the news, read newspapers, or listen to talk radio, you hear a constant barrage of negative information. It really doesn't matter which side of the political aisle you prefer, the news is always bad. So I'm sitting in the living room with my in-laws uh, over the holidays, and Fox News is on, and Glenn Beck, it's the Glenn Beck Show, Whatever happened, to, never mind. Uh, <laughs> by the end of the hour, I wanted to move to another country. In that single show, they predicted a worsening economy, devaluing of the dollar, hyperinflation, higher taxes, more government corruption, and then they added a few other things just to make it good. Amen. Well, it's just all bad according to them. When you look forward to the future, let me ask you something. Are you excited or are you anxious? As we face the challenges that are before us, are you thrilled about what God is doing or uh, are you fearful, nervous, doubtful, and worried? That, that's what I wrote in 2010. I want to read you some lyrics you're going to immediately, or if you were alive back then, you're immediately going to understand and, and recognize this is from those famous philosophers called the Temptations. <laughs> I know who's old in here. <laughs> the sale of pills is at an all-time high. Young folks walking around with their heads in the sky. The city's aflame in the summertime. And the beat goes on. Air pollution, revolution, gun control, sound of soul. Shooting rockets to the moon, kids growing up too soon. Politicians say more taxes will solve everything. And the band played on. 
So round and round and round we go. Where are the world's head? Where are the world's headed? Nobody knows. It's just a ball of confusion. Oh yeah, that's what the world is today. It's just a ball of confusion. And you know what? You can even go further back than that. You can go all the way back to the time of Jesus. You can even go further back than that. You can go all the way back to the time of King David, which we're about to do in Psalm 37. David lived in one of the most tumultuous times recorded in the Old Testament. And yet in Psalm 37, he gives us the way that we can always look forward with confidence. And so uh, the, the central truth of this message is, through faith, Christians can face the future with confidence. And so I want to give you these three little precepts that are found in this psalm and, uh, and unpack a little bit that's around them so that we can all face the future with confidence. The first one is this. We can face the future with confidence because God is sovereign. God is sovereign. Uh, the psalmist in this psalm, he contrasts the righteous with the wicked. He keeps showing us how the wicked seems to prosper but then in the end, God judges them and God watches over the righteous. In each comparison, one of the things you'll notice in Psalm 37 is the frequent use of the name or the title, the Lord, L-O-R-D. If you notice in your Bible, L-O-R-D is all caps. That means they're using the proper name for God, which means He is the self-existing one. He is the sovereign creator of everything that's ever been created. Also notice the number of times. I counted ten times in the psalm that the psalmist makes reference to the Lord. In verse uh, 3, trust in the Lord. Verse 4, delight in the Lord. Commit your way to the Lord. Verse 5. Verse 7, rest in the Lord. Verse 9, evildoers will be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord. You see my point? He's saying that the Lord is our hope, our rock, our confidence, and because He is sovereign, we don't need to fear what may be. Here's what, uh, notice in verse 39 and 40, how he ends this psalm. But the righteous, I'm sorry, but the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord, he is their strength in time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in Him. Now, God is sovereign. One, one uh, uh, commentator said this, Whatever else we do, we must not be envious of the unrighteous. The earth is the only heaven they are ever going to have. The blade of retribution will soon mow them down and their specular career or their spectacular careers will fade and wither. You see what the psalmist is upset. He says, uh, don't fret because of evildoers. The word fret means to burn. Have you ever been just blazing mad because of the situation? I, I told Cindy the other night, I said, turn that news off. It's just burning me up. I can't stand it. Uh, uh, and, and that's what happens. You just, you just, it just turns you into a flame on the inside. Now, uh, what can we do today to determine if we are going to live by the principle that God is sovereign? God is sovereign means, to say that God is sovereign means God is in ultimate control of everything that there is. Uh, that doesn't mean that God causes every bad thing that happens. I hear people sometimes say that, that they think that something bad happens. They say, well, God must have done that for some reason. Well, God allowed it for some reason, but God doesn't cause things bad to happen. He's not the author of evil. He doesn't do wicked things. And so there are wicked things that happen in this world. God has allowed, under His sovereign control, He has allowed all of us to have a certain amount of limited freedom. Within that limited freedom, sometimes people do wicked things. The psalmist is upset about that, and he keeps fretting. He, he's, he's telling people, don't fret about don't burn, don't be upset, don't dwell on that. Instead, turn your attention to the sovereign God who watches over us. And so, uh, if we believe that God is sovereign, uh, how are we going to live by that principle? 
Well, listen to these verses. Psalm 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Psalm 118, 6. The Lord is for me. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The psalmist says, if God is for me, there's not a single living, breathing person that can harm me in one way unless the Lord allows it. And so we are in the hands of our sovereign God. When David... King David, the one who wrote this psalm, he went out to face Goliath. It's just almost a comical story. When you read it, the, the warriors of Israel had been hiding in their foxholes for 40 days. And David sat down there with a little bit of cheese and some milk and some stuff to feed these guys. He gets down there and uh, he hears that whoever kills this giant is going to get the king's daughter as a bride and is going to get all these. And David says, well, where's he at? I will kill him. And, and, and his brothers say to him, and this is what's comical, his brothers say to him, you just come down here to see a fight. What fight? They've been hiding for 40 days. <laughs> and David says, well, listen, I'm going to take care of him. But David didn't say because I'm, I, I, I'm so smart. David didn't say because I'm so good. David didn't say because I'm just real good with a slingshot. Listen to what David said. You, he's talking to the Philistine. You come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord God of hosts. You know what the Lord God of hosts means? Translation, the God of heavenly armies. Oh, you got a giant on your side. Let me tell you about my giant, David says. <laughs> it's the same God you believe in. It's the same God you just sang about. It's the same God you worship every Sunday. It's the same God who got you up this morning. It's the same God who's taking care of you. And it's the same God who's numbered every single one of your days. What do you got to worry about? I'll tell you what, we got a giant killing God. What do we got to fear? Amen. Proverbs 18 10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and is safe. In these days of toil and confusion, it seems like the whole world is spinning out of control. But beloved, Romans 8, 28 says that we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to His purpose. Is God in control? Well, absolutely He is, but some people don't believe that. And so what happens to somebody who forgets or doesn't believe that God is ultimately in control? Well, they've got to figure out who is or what is. So if God's not in control, what is? Well, is the government? Let's hope not. <laughs> is, is, is science? Not our science. Uh, is your job ultimately in control? Is that, is that what you put your confidence in? If God is in control, why are we worried about tomorrow? If you place your confidence and security in your own strength, then you've got reason to fret. You've got reason to worry about the wicked. You've got reason to worry about the economy. If you're dependent on these two hands to get you through, then you've got a good reason to be worried. Fret means to burn, to flash, to be in anger. Why else do you think there are mass shootings going on? It's because people have lost hope. That's why. And out of sheer anger, they just burn everything down around them and destroy themselves in the process. It's because they don't have hope that there is a sovereign God in charge of things in this universe. Listen, if we're Christians, then we believe that God is sovereign over the affairs of this world. God is working all things for His glory by His infallible Word and by His sovereign, omnipotent, mighty, unstoppable hand. Almighty God has guaranteed that every blood-bought, spirit-born child of God will have eternal life and nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Listen, everything's going to work out. It's going to be okay. God has already said so. I read the book. I know how it ends. Hallelujah. And the Bible says, I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing. Any other created thing? Everything.
things being created except for one thing. Have you ever thought of that? He says, every other, nothing shall separate us from the love of God. No created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. There's only one thing in this universe that's not created, and that's God himself. And so there's nothing in the whole wide world, the entire universe. If they discover Martians out there somewhere, hallelujah, I'll preach Jesus to them. But I'm telling you, they can't separate you from Jesus. Amen. Y'all get happy, all right? It's fine with me. If you feel like having a spell, just wipe off a spot and go to it. Amen. Woo! If I was in the South, they'd be rolling aisles right now. Notice what he says. He says, trust, well, delight, commit, rest, wait. David said that because David believed God is sovereign. And so... We can face the future with confidence when we understand and believe that there is a mighty hand watching over us and he cannot be deterred from his purpose. Number two, we can face the future with confidence because God is faithful. God is faithful. Now, what do we mean by faithful? It means that you can depend on every word of God. God cannot, it is impossible for God to lie. You can depend on God. When God makes a promise, He means what He says. But it's even more than that. Not only does God make promises, but because He's sovereign, He is able to make the promises that He made come to pass. What that means is God can make a way where there ain't no way. God, God got the children of Israel up to the edge of the Red Sea, and they said, what are we going to do? We can't all swim at once. And we ain't started baptizing yet, so what are we going to do? That was a Baptist joke. I don't know. Uh, God got him up there and Moses just stuck the hand out. And the Lord, who is faithful, who promised to deliver them, got him to the other side. Beloved, you can depend on God. Look, look what it says in verse 4 and 6. Delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in Him and He will do it. He's able. God is able. God is able to do. Now, that does not mean that because God is faithful that we Christians are somehow exempt from all trouble. Sometimes we suffer at the hands of evil people. Uh, in verse 12 of the psalm, it says, the wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes at him with his teeth. So sometimes... Uh, because there's wicked people in the world and their wickedness and their sin or my sin and my wickedness affects those around us. And so sometimes we, we even though we're righteous or, or living in the will of God, we still experience troubles. Sometimes we are uh, experience times of difficulty because we're under the chastisement of God. God's disciplining us. And uh, uh, He wants to correct some behaviors. Sometimes believers face difficult trials because of their faith. Peter says, and Peter, uh, 1 Peter 1, 6, he talked to some people, he wrote to some people who were going under very bad, uh, severe trials. And he says, in this you greatly rejoice, that is, that because they've been saved, they're greatly rejoicing, even though for now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. Peter, Peter, Peter says, listen, just because you're saved, and just because you're walking with God, that don't mean you're exempt from all problems and all trouble and all heartaches and all that because sometimes there's some unique uh, troubles that come to you because you're saved. And here's why. So that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. There's a reason God has for allowing us to go through these things. And then sometimes God judges nations. And when God judges nations, uh, if you study the Old Testament, God raised up uh, heathen nations to come against Israel. And when they did, uh, people suffered. And uh, that, that, that's something that happens. And even during those times, listen, God has promised that even in difficult times, maybe we're suffering for our faith or we're suffering because of somebody's sin or maybe whatever, God has not promised to 
get us out of all trouble, but what he has promised is to keep us through all trouble. Do you understand the difference? I'd love for somebody just to, just to stop me and say, Steve, you don't do that. I need that, right? But, 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 but God doesn't get us all out of all trouble. You get yourself in it, he's going to let you go through it, but he's going to watch over you while you do it. Amen? Listen to what the Bible says. He says that we need to dwell and cultivate. In verse 7, he says to wait, those that wait on the Lord. And so when difficult situations come in our life and things don't look so good to us, we don't need to turn our backs on God. What we need to do is press into God. When things are difficult and times are tough and your strength is gone, who can you trust? Who can you turn to? The psalmist said in Psalm 46, 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. God is here. God is here in the Spirit. God is indwelling the Christian to lead and guide and to, to help us be victory, uh, have victory in our lives. Think about the multiple examples of God's faithfulness. Man, the Bible's full of God being faithful. I, th I think of, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The reason, you know, we all remember their names is because we was kids, right? Uh, my parents said it's Shadrach, Meshach, and off the bed you go, you know. Uh, uh, and so I remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And uh, uh, th those, those three guys, they, they stand up before the king, and, and he says, listen, if you just bow down, just, just, just do it. I know you don't mean it, but just do it. Now, now, I can't do that. Well, all right, then, I'm going to put you in far. And you know what they said to him? They said, okay. <laughs> they said, okay, but let me tell you this, king. Listen, you can put us in that fire. And we're not going to worship your God. But know this. Know this. If God wants us to burn up, we'll burn up. But if our God wants us to be delivered, read it. He says, our God is able to deliver us. I, I tell you, if you want to have a hallelujah time, get you a computer and look up the number of times in the Scripture where the words God is able or He is able Woo, son, if you don't have a spell, you ain't got a spell in you. I'm telling you, because God is able. The Bible says that He is able to do, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, He is able to do exceedingly, abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. And that sounds amazing in the English, but do you know that the Apostle Paul had to create words to put in that verse? God is able, and because He's able, you can depend on Him. Listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said, look at the birds of the air. They, 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 they don't sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns. Well, if there's people, we'd say they're lazy. <laughs> they don't work, they don't sow, they don't reap, they don't even save up for the winter. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? When's the last time you saw a worried bird? When's the last time you walked out and looked up there on the wire and there's three of them sitting up there watching CNN just worried to death? <laughs> Listen, God, God, God will take care of you, man. God's going to take care of you. I went, on a, I went on a mission trip one time, and uh, I didn't really intend to go. Our, our associate pastor came to, to me. I, was, I wasn't a pastor of church. I was just attending the church. And he came to me, and he said, hey, we got this mission trip out in Montana. You think you might want to go? And I, and I told him this. I said, if the Lord makes it so I can get off work, then I'll go. He said, good enough. I said, I'll ask tomorrow. And so... I worked in a trailer shop, a bunch of uh, mechanics in there. And anyway, uh, I, I went in and I told the guy that I worked for, my, my boss, I said, I got this mission trip coming up. He thought that was hilarious. And uh, I told him it was going to be two weeks long. And finally, he said, look, I can't spare you. You can't go. You don't have a vacation. I said, okay, no, no problem. And so I went back to my pastor on Wednesday night and I said, look, 
I can't go, can't get off work. He said, well, I didn't, I just thought you'd be able to go. And I said, well, all right. Friday at work, I fell through a trailer and busted up my pelvis. He said, that's bad. Oh, it's a terrible weekend. <laughs> Thursday night, Cindy had the washing machine walking around out in the garage. That thing just went haywire. <laughs> and then Friday, I fell through a trailer and got all busted up. And on, on Saturday morning, I'm at the hospital, and she comes in telling me the car won't run, transmission, transmission busted. And she got the transmission fixed before I got out of the hospital, and then Sarah, my daughter, drove it through a garage and tore the... And here's the good thing. They came to me and the doctor said, you're going to be on workman's comp for the next six months. Well, within four weeks, I was able to walk without crutches. I said to the Lord, if you make it where I can get off work. <laughs> but let me tell you something. We got in two vans and went to Montana from Tennessee with 17 teenagers. First thing one of them did when we got out there, we were sleeping in a hall of a school. Why did boys eat a bunch of junk food and then throw it up on mission nights? I don't understand that. <laughs> Third night of that mission trip, there's this car pulled up. It's an old Cadillac. It was crammed to the brim with Native American boys and girls to come to Bible school. Out there on the reservation, they don't have to have tags, they don't have to have license, they don't have anything. Just get in and go. That Cadillac was driven by a 12-year-old girl. Kids fell off of it and jumped out when they got there, and she wasn't coming in because she was too tough. And to make a long story short, I got to go over there and share the gospel with her, and God touched her heart. And she said the prayer, and she asked Jesus to come into her life. And I'm not talking about anything I've done, but praise God, He is faithful. Amen. Commit your way unto the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. He's able. And then finally, I just want to say, we can face the future with confidence because God is graceful. God is graceful. Notice a couple of verses, and I'm coming in for a landing. So verse 23, the steps of a man are established by the Lord, and he delights in his way. When he falls, he will not be hurled headlong because the Lord is the one who holds his hand. <laughs> man, that's good stuff, ain't it? How many of you had a fall? Oh, yeah, we've all had a fall, hadn't we? If you ain't had one this week, you'll have one next week. If anybody in the Bible knew about failure, it's King David. Now, David knew a lot about success, and we just finished the life of David on Wednesday night, one of the better studies I've enjoyed preparing for. David was a tremendous man of God. He, he had victories over the Philistines, over the giants, over all the external enemies that rose up against Israel. God made a covenant with the house of David forever. It was through him, the, the, line, of, the line of the tribe of Judah, the Lord Jesus Christ came from David, but David also knew extreme failure in his life. David was a massive failure at home. His kids hated each other. They killed each other. When they got grown, they went to war against each other. David's wives despised one another because he had wives. That's why they despised each other. <laughs> Rightly so. But instead of living with regret, listen to what he wrote in Psalm 103, verse 8 through 11. King David wrote, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. He'll not always strive with us, nor will He keep His anger forever. He's not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great 
is His loving kindness towards those who fear Him. I fail a lot. How about you? Amen would be good. But did you ever stop to think that just because you fail, that don't mean you're a failure? God knew that we would be failures and He knew that we would fail Him when He saved us. And we all sin and sin miserably, but God does not forsake us when we fail. He does not discard us when we stumble. If we believe that God is great, graceful, we can face the future uh, with confidence. The Bible says in Hebrews 13 that God will never leave us nor forsake us. So why do we fret? Why do we burn? Why do we get all worked up over the wicked who seem to flourish and prosper? The Bible says they'll wither quickly like the grass in verse 2. Evil doers will be cut off in verse 9. The Lord laughs at them and He sees their day coming according to verse 17. The Lord, the sovereign Lord who controls the future, who is faithful, is never going to leave you nor forsake you if you're His child. And the Bible says if we confess our sin, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins, cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Somebody asked me the other day, he said, what's the difference between grace and mercy? Well, they're twin sisters that usually come in a package, but there is a subtle difference. Hebrews 4.15 uh, says this, We have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses, one who's been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence. That is our word for today, face the future with confidence. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. Here it is. This is what we need. This is what we get. So that we may receive mercy, and find grace to help in time of need. Mercy and grace. Mercy is what all of us need to remove our past guilt. Mercy is what all of us need and we receive through grace in Jesus Christ. Jesus died on the cross to remove the penalty of our sins. And whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Beloved, that is mercy. God does, I just read to you, David said God does not deal with us as our sins deserve, but He throws our sins as far as the east is from the west, as high as the heavens are to the earth. His compassion is so, His mercy never fails. What about grace? Well, you need mercy for the past, you need grace for the present, and for the future. Who can live without God's grace? We need grace every hour. Did you ever did you ever do anything and as soon as you did it, you said, Oh, that was stupid. <laughs> well, I wasn't here last week. Let me tell you, people have been asking me about my trip. I didn't know them U Hauls would only do 75. <laughs> it's awful, man. And we had Hannah Blake stuff. The back was full. It was only a 10-footer, and, but I had the passenger seat full, and I made me a little nest. That didn't, have, didn't have cruise, didn't have tilt wheel, had a gas pedal. And I had it at the floor. But before I got in, uh, it was sprazzling a little bit of rain. Y'all know these curly cues are everywhere, right? I live amongst the rainforest of the ranch club, and... Uh, they, and so, have you ever done this? Take a windshield wiper to get them curly cues off and just flop it against the window? When I did that, I knew that was stupid. Because as soon as I did it, the wiper blade popped off. <laughs> and so I picked it up and stuck it back on. And we got in, we drove off. There wasn't another drop of rain until we got to the south side of Jacksonville, Florida. Now, everybody knows this time of year, somewhere in Florida, it's a monsoon. And I found it. (laughs) And I'm on Interstate 95, doing every bit of 75. (laughs) 
And all of a sudden, whoo, somebody flushed on top of me. Man, it was coming down. I flipped that windshield wiper on. It scraped across one time and then it hit me. I didn't get it on good. And I couldn't see anything. And it scraped back across. And I knew if it went one more time, that rubber part that I absolutely have to have is going to go flanging off on 95. And so I turned the windshield wipers off, slowed down to 65. (laughs) And thought to myself, what am I going to do? I prayed. I cried out to God. I said that prayer I talked to you about the other day that God always answers. Help me, Lord! I started steering. I I, I, I slowed back a little bit. I I could see an exit up there. Mm, Maybe I can get it before I hit somebody. I couldn't see anything. I mean, the windshield was nothing but a solid sheet of water. I limped off. I knew I was getting off the ramp when it started going, oh, I pull it back up in there. I found a Wawa that had one of them things, you know, get in under the rain. I pulled up under there. Listen, talking about grace now. That little piece of rubber was still on the windshield wiper. It didn't come off. Now, I'm going to tell you all something. I would like to tell y'all that I got out of that predicament because of my superior driving capabilities. (laughs) And because of my cat-like reflexes and my instincts. But God knows, and I know, as soon as I got parked under that, I said, thank you, Jesus. Now, what are you talking about, preacher? I'm talking about grace. Listen, grace, grace. We are so used to seeing God's grace every day that we just take it for granted. I've heard five different answers to prayers this morning. Grace, grace, God's grace. Man, listen, you're blessed with it. You are running over with it. Your cup is full of it. It's pouring all over you. God's grace. Listen, I saw the... Uh, what, what, what Kevin's going to play here in just a few minutes. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Grace, grace, it's free. It's available. Do you want some of it? Come get some of it. All you got to do is say a prayer of faith and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and turn your life over to Him. And God in His sovereignty and in His faithfulness will extend His grace. And you can be a child of God before you go home. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sins. Grace, grace, come get your grace. Let's stand by. Bow your head, close your eyes. Let's all stand. Bow your head, close your eyes. Oh, beloved, you can face the future because God is sovereign and because God is faithful and His grace is upon you. Lord Jesus, we thank You for Your sweet grace. We thank You, Lord, that we don't have to trust in our own strength, but we have You to lean on. And we thank You today, God, that we can depend on You. And so, Lord, today, if there's anyone here who needs grace, let them know. Touch them with Your Spirit. Let them know grace can be found because of the cross. And Lord, if there's anyone here today who just needs to pray or or has another uh, something to pray about, if they want to come together as a a family, just, just... I just pray, Lord, a sense of freedom would rain down upon this place and use this message, Lord, in some way to encourage. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.